we begin today's webinar, I would like to conduct an acknowledgement of country. Now, I think that these are very important for us to um, consider, especially as open practitioners, because as open practitioners, we are very much about building on the work of people who came before us, acknowledging their work. And acknowledgement is something which is absolutely core to the way in which we engage with openness. And so I think that I have a, I have a personal connection with wanting to do acknowledgement of country and wanting to engage with our First Nations practitioners, because I think that it is absolutely core to what we do as open practitioners. So in that spirit, the University of Southern Queensland would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we gather. We would also like to pay our respect to all elders, past, present and emerging. And I would very much appreciate if people took a moment um, today to post in the chat the country upon which you are living and working so that you're able to acknowledge in your own manner the, um, the country upon which we stand presently. And with that, I will pass over to Stephen uh, to introduce our speakers this morning. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're so excited to have Sarita and Carolee here today. Just to briefly introduce them, Sarita is a tenure track instructor in the Faculty of Education at the University of British Columbia in Canada. And her teaching specialisations are lifespan development, diversity and critical pedagogy. Her current research focuses on the scholarship of teaching and learning and open educational resources. Dr. Carolee Klein is a learning strategy consultant with a focus on universal design for learning in higher education, and she focuses on how faculty can adapt their classrooms to embed UDL, uh, practices of open educational resources, and open pedagogy to create an engaging and inclusive learning space for everyone through proactive design. So thank you, Sarita and Carolee, for being here and navigating all these Australian time zones and stuff. So um, take it away. Great, thank you. It's uh, great to see so many of you out here today. I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. Okay, um, so just begin. Um, so as you know, and from the introduction that we're gonna be talking about universal design for learning and explain how this research educational framework works well with core values and ideals of open education. And my name is Sarita Jangiani. For those who cannot see me, I'm a shorter woman with long dark hair and I use the pronouns she, her. I would like to acknowledge that UBC, Vancouver's Point Grey campus, is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. I'm Carolee Klein, and for those who cannot see me, I'm a shorter, mature cis woman with medium length, light brown, and gray hair wearing glasses, and I use the pronouns she and her. I respectfully acknowledge that the land on, put, on which I live, work, and play is the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Kaitli Tene Nation in a location also known as Prince George, BC, Canada, and that this land may also include the territories of other carrier nations. In preparing this session, we use these guiding questions to frame what we share today. What is universal design for learning? As this group is focused on open educational practices, we are introducing U UDL. What is open? We want to ensure that we all have a common definition that we're working from. What is the bridge between UDL and open? We're looking to provide you with insights how these two topics support each other. Why does this matter? We believe UDL enables a foundation to enable learners to achieve success in open as UDL strives to reduce and remove barriers to learning for everyone creating an inclusive environment. And how is this inclusive? Through the idea of proactive design provides flexibility and recognizes intersectionality can come in many forms, which is why planning for learner variability supports inclusion.
first to start our session, we would like to hear from you. So we have a short Mentimeter survey ready to go to start our conversation and to better hear where you are presently. Uh, there are three questions we are prompting you to reflect upon as we start the session. We will be showing the results. We'll give you a few moments. Uh, you can go ahead and answer all three questions at your own pace. And we're gonna give everyone some time to reflect and consider these questions. First question is, what makes a successful learning experience? For yourself as a learner, as an instructor? We've got our session there. Um, the second question is, what is the most important element for successful instruction? There are no right and wrong answers to any of this. This is just a chance to think about what you see as the most important. And the last question that we're asking you is what does UDL mean to you? And we recognize that UDL may be completely unfamiliar to, to you, but we're asking you to reflect on what you understand it to be or what it means as we commence the session. We're just looking to where are you at today as we start. We'll just give a few moments. And I can see people are progressing through the ment Mentimeter. So we'll just give it another few moments. And then we'll share those results with you. And we'll just look as we start our session. Okay, we'll just start. Uh... We're just sharing what those results. Um, I think the first thing that's standing out is is engagement is definitely a very strong uh, part and what uh, to successful learning. And I think that uh, speaks to what I think a lot of people do understand. It's interesting to see connection, understanding, interest, relevance. Uh, other ones that are standing out is really important. And in this one, it's clearly winning out is the relevance uh, and the participation it's right up there, content. And I, we have a bit of other, uh, and we would have loved to ask you to qualify that, but it didn't give us that option. This is great. I think you'll find the what we have in our talk very appropriate and helpful. And looking at uh, comments, the accessible differences, options, engaging and relevant. Uh, this is this is all lovely, and really I think fits to what we're bringing to you today. Justice, active learning, flexible inclusion, everyone. This is great. Thank you for, for helping contribute and we will get started here.
So we'll start with an overview of universal design for learning. UDL is a way of thinking about teaching and learning that helps give all of the learners an equal opportunity to succeed. It is the why, the how, what, and the how of learning based on neuroscience research about learning. This framework helps guide the design based on theory, practice, and research with the intention of creating expert learners. It isn't about mastering a specific topic, but it's about learning and the mastering of that. It is about supporting learners to know how to learn whatever their particular strengths or weaknesses are and how to use those to their advantage. A key value in this approach is recognizing learner variability. By this, we recognize and realize all learners are unique. Dr. Todd Rose has an excellent TED talk, TED talk on the myth of average, and I encourage you to view it. It is included in our references and resources section at the end of the presentation, and we will be making that available. UDL, the UDL approach offers flexibility in the ways learners access material, engage with it, and show what they know. It's about providing options and reducing the barriers. So this would be developing lesson plans this way that helps all learners, but it may be especially helpful for learners with lear learning and thinking differences. Intentionally building in flexibility in the design of the learning environment, along with adding in supports and scaffolds to support this journey. The long established educational model of knowledge transfer as being one directional is ingrained in traditional learning spaces. This traditional approach is challenged with this thinking, and yet research is identifying this is a good thing. So UDL and open approaches look to shift the support to, to shift to support the 21st century needs for lifelong learning and knowledge co-construction in these very dynamic times. The UDL framework is based on three principles: engagement, which was also the number one choice of uh, reasons for effective learning. This is the why of learning. This is the effective neural network, and it is now recognized to be a very strong influencer on the success. Your learners need to want to learn and to be motivated. This is where interest and effort and persistence are acted upon. Such that this would be planning for your audience engagement. It helps to create the positive learning space. The principle of representation, which is the what of learning. This is the recognition neural network and is making sense of the patterns around us for learning, providing information in various formats such as video, podcast, print, and infographics are just some of the ways information can be presented and help learners to make connections to ideas. Action and expression is the how of learning, or the actions to build our understanding and to enable us to become strategic in learning actions and is based on the strategic neural network. This can be providing different ways for learners to demonstrate they are learning while working with the content. It can also be in enabling options for learners to express their skills and understanding. An example is the use of origami to represent mathematical concepts, and it enables learners to be interacting with the ideas and connecting with the concepts. What is displayed on this page right now, while it visually is, is difficult to read, it is the, a, a snapshot of the one-page UDL guidelines available at cast.org. It is the UDL, these UDL guidelines are presented in a very simple, easy to read grid. And this, this is helpful to be, provide a variety of different access points. The grid illustrates the three key principles in a column format with the rows detailing the progression. The top row lists the title or the principle, and the bottom row lists the goal that UDL as a whole of striving towards developing expert learners. The columns are even color coded using the green for the principle of engagement, the purple for the principle of representation, and the blue for the principle of, act, of action and expression. And for those that are always looking for that physical explanation, if you look closely at the images across the top of the columns, there are images of the brain identifying the approximate areas included with that principle's neural network, giving a visual representation. The rows in between are about a progress from external influences 
to internal processes. UDL is a, a way of thinking about teaching and learning that gives us all learners an equal opportunity to succeed. So this strives to reduce the barriers by supporting the uni uniqueness of individuals and their ways of knowing. These differences could be language differences, they could be cultural differences or requiring accommodations for sound or visual requirements. This approach offers the flexibility in the ways learners access material and engage with it and show what they know. This framework is able to be understood at a high level with the one page UDL guidelines while also being flexible enough in its own design to go deeper if you wish. To understand what UDL it is, it helps to understand what it is not. The word universal may throw you off. It may sound like UDL is about finding one way to teach everyone, but UDL actually takes the opposite approach. The goal of UDL is to use a variety of instructional methods to remove any barriers to learning and to give all learners equal opportunities to succeed. This could be language, culture, oppression, marginalization, and accessibility. It's about building in flexibility that can be adjusted for every learner's strengths and needs. And this is why UDL benefits everyone. The variability can be also within the students in different contexts. For example, a music student might thrive in a music classroom when presenting or performing, but struggle in the class from marketing. So UDL has emerged as a framework for looking at facilitating learning by considering that all learners have different needs. It's about removing the barriers and not just providing accommodations. Although often designing to the margins provides access and approaches that can be used by the majority. For example, closed captioning initially was provided for hearing impairments, but is estimated to be used more by partners watching the TV trying to keep the volume down. So the predictable area of learner variability is what led to UDL. Designing to the margins better serves the, the majority. In its simplest explanation, UDL is about, about providing multiple ways to learning to allow learners to select which path they wish or need. It's not about a checklist. It's not, nor is it technology-based. Although, Technology can help provide multiple ways and is a powerful tool to capitalize on for helping provide that flexibility. But it should also be fluid enough to enable adaptation as necessary. The understanding of how learners differ help to consider how a diversity of opportunities exist in reaching many learners. Now this sounds daunting, but if you start with small steps, it doesn't need to be overwhelming. So if each time you look at your learning plan, you think of one small change, it starts to become easier. So how do you get there? How does UDL fit in the open education with open pedagogy? UDL provides the foundation to recognizing that all learners are unique and proactively designing for learner for variability. Thomas Tobin, uh, reach everyone, teach everyone. This, it, provides the suggestion of how you, ways you can do that. Um, this concept of design can be expanded by using materials that are accessible through format and cost to learners and through the selection of activities that enable learners to bring their own voice to the learning space. With UDL, you begin with clear goals. Ensure your goals are presented so that learners can perceive and understand what the goal is. Keep your goals, try to keep your goals separate from the means where possible. So for example, a goal that states writing a report is prescribing the means by which learners demonstrate what they know. This privileges those who express themselves easily in this means. The, especially at higher education, this is still not something that's uh, the uh, flexibility in the assessment is still a challenge, but it might be reasonable in a, you know, a writing course to require that. But the way that you could bring UDL into that writing course would be to be provide options to develop the ideas in different ways with the end result transitioning to be written. Present your goals to highlight the relevance for students or for your learners. Seek to include options in each of the neural networks. That's where the guidelines are really useful as a quick, quick look. Uh, you can glance at them and just sort of look at the different colors and think of, oh, have I got something towards that? You can't get everything, 
but it certainly helps spark ideas and uh, evaluation and ensure those goals don't have hidden curriculums in them embedded in their assessment, such as writing for marking for writing style when it was not listed as one of the goals. An example for that one is um, that I can use is from an early childhood education course that they had the practicum, the students were out in a practicum and they wanted a journal. What they found is the students were really struggling because there was so much focus on having the writing and the APA formatting that they weren't expressing what they really knew. And when they changed it to have the students submit either whatever they wanted, whether it be a voice memo, whether it be a drawing, they found that it was more interesting as the instructor to be marking it, stay at the same goal. They're wanting to see the students are, are uh, practicing their theory into or applying their theory to their practicum. But it became, the students had an outlet that was much more creative. So it was one that was very uh, effective to change that. Uh, your ma materials and methods, ensure flexible materials are available for learners. Materials include media and tools such as sharing information with the learners. It could be include digital technologies such as a glossary that is hyperlinked throughout your materials or an online video uh, detailing something. It could be options such as a whiteboard. The UDL materials can be very flexible and ensure enable different pathways progressing towards the goal that's defined. And the materials should be aligned to the intended goal. Also ensure that you've got flexible methods available for learners. Where possible, provide flexible assessment options. For example, if writing isn't the goal of the, of the work and, and writing comes up a lot, especially in higher ed, then allow other ways to assess, such as a podcast or recorded presentation, and en enable your students to choose their optimal way to demonstrate they understood. And for marking, you're still looking at the same goals being met. It might come in different ways, but, the, but you're still looking for demonstration of, of comprehension. So universal design is, built, is about the proactive approach, providing a framework built on the recognition, the strategic and effective networks, using the UDL guidelines as a tool to help look for ideas and specific considerations when applying to practice. And just to return to the UDL uh, guidelines, looking at the structure of the UDL guidelines, there are these levels of the rows. And these, the external, they include the external access, the supporting build, the process to internalize, and these all progress towards the development of expert learners. This progression supports the next step and the idea of open pedagogy where learners co-create knowledge and contribute in the but in particular in the realm of higher education. As the UDL principle of engagement relates, relates to the emotional element, the opportunity through open pedagogy activities to create new knowledge and to share broadly provides learners a voice, a powerful one, and helps build confidence and self-value. What you know really does matter. Previous experiences drive the interest and engagement, the perception and the attention, and goals and actions. Realizing the variability in learner background knowledge and experience is important. By valuing the uniqueness, this empowers learners to use their strengths and focus, focus on the challenges and motivate their own learning experiences when they are these expert learners. Higher ed traditionally looks in the early years in university and college as rites of passage or gatekeeping. But why does learning need to be competitive and one over the other? If the benefit to society is to have a more educated thinking, why are we planning for attrition and not focusing on success for all? If more understanding can be fostered through the voice of students, doesn't this benefit all of us? Um, and I just wanted to highlight in terms of um, thinking about our students and building these skills, it's important that students are provided with opportunities to become expert learners. This is especially important when we think of open educational practices and the creation of open educational resources. If we want our students to contribute to the creation of OERs, they need to build their expertise. However, we also need to acknowledge that our learners come with different backgrounds and levels of understanding. And so it's important that we provide them with opportunities to build their knowledge in an area. 
in order to contribute to the co-creation of resources and educational materials in meaningful ways. Um, in applying UDL principles, we also need to consider how our pedagogical practices reflect this. So for instance, if students are assigned group work, do we set any parameters around turn-taking, sharing information, or ways to avoid having one individual, individual being seen as the expert that we draw our insights for, insights from and rely on them, or avoid having them dominate the, the discussion. So with this, um, let's move a little on and go into what are open educational resources. You may be familiar with this definition. Um, so open educational resources are teaching and learning and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access, use, adaptation, and redistribution by others with no or limited restrictions. So I wanna draw your attention to a few things. The open and OER refers to materials being freely available and able to be used by all. And open educational resources can be any type of educational material. Um, their scale can vary. It can be something as small as a class handout or an image or something as large as a textbook or an online course. With MIT courseware uh, being one example of this, while traditional course resources come with restrictive copyright laws. OERs use open copyright licenses like Creative Commons. Depending on the creator's desires, these licenses allow for different degrees of openness and may restrict or preclude um, users from engaging in one or more of the five R's. So I won't go right now into the five R's, but um, if you're not familiar with them, please let me know and I'll, I'll pop some information into the chat. So when we talk about open pedagogy, um, what are we talking about here? So we're talking about using open licensing to improve and enhance teaching and learning. This is one definition. For example, thinking about how you can involve students in the process of knowledge co-creation or democratize the process of teaching and learning. And I'll um, give you a few examples as well here. Oops, that went by really quickly. I apologize. Let me go through it <laughs> quickly. Um, sorry, I didn't realize they were all sequenced together. Um, so one of the examples that I had there that flashed by really quickly was um, a part, it was Dr. Amin Assam is one example, who has his medical students who will become GPs, write and improve articles on a number of topics. So this is a great example of knowledge mobilization and also in terms of skill development to explain complex medical terms in a way that's accessible to all. And this is also a public service and it's, um, as I mentioned, focusing on skill development. I also had another screenshot there that had um, students who created instructional videos um, for their class presentations. Uh, and in that video, there were um, students who had, uh, won an international competition and they were from the University of Simon Fraser. And so those are just some of the examples of open pedagogy practices. And I just want to um, highlight this resource on this page. It's openpedagogy.org. Uh, open so if you want to learn more about open pedagogy, which goes beyond OER, but involving students in the co-creation, you can visit uh, this website here, um, which is an open pedagogy notebook where you can look at examples of open pedagogy and practice across a range of disciplines. So it's a really great resource. Do check that out. And as we're thinking through and considering, one of the things that I noticed in the mentee that really came up was inclusivity and justice. So as we consider social justice and open education, here are some principles that I want you to take into consideration from Nancy Fraser's work on social justice. Um, Fraser highlights these three areas. So redistributive justice, which is the allocations of material or human resources towards those who by circumstances might have less. So this is, might be just the creation of OERs. Um, so for those um, different socioeconomic status, it may be a financial burden to buy some of these costly textbooks. Um, so this is one example. Then we have recognitive justice. 
This is recognition and respect for cultural and gender differences. So having examples of diversity in open curriculum, inclusion of images, case studies, um, knowledges of women, First Nations people, and whoever, whoever is marginalized in any particular nation, regional, or learning context. And lastly, we have representational justice. So this involves equitable representation and political voice. Um, so that marginalized groups are able to speak for themselves. And it's not that we have somebody who's outside of that group speaking for marginalized individuals. And the reason why I'm highlighting this is that it's important when thinking about UDL that we're intentional about our critical pedagogies and scaffold our learners to begin to question how our knowledges and practices may be embedded in hegemonic knowledge structures that espouse Eurocentric ideals. If we're serious about social justice, we need to ensure we also do not do further harm, begin to think about how our practices are decreasing barriers to epistemic justice. So just one quick example here, as I'm um, aware of time, is that it's great if we create OERs that help um, marginalized students, but if we don't include images that they can see themselves representing, we need to question what we're doing when we're creating those OERs. And going a step further with rep representational justice, we also want to ensure that we have voices um, of groups that are marginalized representing themselves and sharing their experiences and knowledge as well. And with that, we'll consider our next steps and I'll bring it back to Kara Lee. Thanks, Rita. Um, so UDL helps ensure learners are well positioned to contribute to, through open pedagogy and provides that framework to enable opportunities for all learners to creating learning, for, creating learning for all. So don't be overwhelmed, but rather start with one small thing each time you look at your instructional plan. Um, and at this time, we welcome any questions and open the floor. Yes, and I also saw in the chat um, that was also represented in an article by Sarah Lambert, which is in the resources as well. Thank you so much, Carolee and Sarita. That was fantastic. And I can see so many connections between everything you've talked about and a lot of the major discussions happening in the Australasian um, OER community. Um, so uh, uh, a lot of great points you made. Did anyone want to ask questions? Adrian, I, yeah. Yes, uh, I'm interested when we're when we're getting students to create OER as a result of open assessment. Um, what are your recommendations or your starting point for for getting students to consider UDL principles as they develop OER within their own learning, um, especially when it is linked to open assessment. Uh, if you're wanting to, I think, expand to to put that in, I think you can capture it with uh, asking the students to think about it from their lens if you're doing as individual, um, but maybe fostering more group that they're considering. Have they expressed it? Have they put it in multiple forms? I mean, it's easy enough to just say or giving it in different ways. Um, and one of the ways you can actually use some of the UDL ideas is to ask students to create the OER in different forms. So you might have a book in in one in a textbook and a student wants to said that concept, that idea came to me, I really wanted a video. And if they create the video that supports the same things, those can now be tied together and you've expanded and you're now helping deliver uh, more UDL centered resources because they're now in different forms. If that Make sense? Did that answer it for you, Adrian? Uh, yes, that uh, that does make a lot of sense. And yeah, getting I think that getting students to actually consider uh, not only their own, own context, but the context of others, I kind of look at that as an extension really of 
when a lot of us in Australia have got graduate attributes which say about considering their role in society, considering yourself as a global citizen, I think that might be a way of us being able to link in some of these ideas uh, to the assessment to our graduate attributes and, and maybe that's a way of gaining traction. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, and, and you're not trying to burden students that they have to go out and learn the whole framework, but even just their voice is what you're trying to empower, however they see to deliver it. So if they see to deliver it in a different format, um, I mean, some of the, the most amazing artwork has emerged when students are given the freedom and they're demonstrating an idea. If you can embed that in with your OER, um, you've you know, just made it richer because I know myself, I look at those, I have such envy of those graphic artists or those graphic, um, those graphic recorders because they capture the ideas and I can look at it and get all the ideas right off the bat. I just wish I could create it myself. Um, but, but if, you know, you've got a student that does that, doesn't that make your OER amazing? I had one question for, for Sarita and then I'll, I'll fade into the background. Um, you mentioned the, the open pedagogy uh, notebook um, uh, in your presentation. I was just wondering if you could um, just mention to the folk here, if we're interested in putting examples from the Australian community into that uh, notebook, is there a process that, that we can follow to to uh, either upload examples or submit examples? Because I'm just thinking that could be a really good um, additional resource for people in this community. Yes, I believe you can just email. There should be an email in there um, that you can um, submit your resources to be uploaded from when I last looked at it. So yeah, it's a great resource um, and to include that sort of international feel to and to add to it. So I would um, recommend that uh, if you've got resources to add those. There's a Thank question you. in the chat, um, Richard. What, uh, maybe could you just clarify a little bit for what you're looking in terms of capturing in terms of the qualitative data for reporting and feedback to faculty? Yeah, it's one of the questions we've had from an author here who's going to be writing an open text in terms of um, obviously go through go through a peer review process. Well, why they're authored, and I, I guess you can involve students in that as well. But um, also in terms of once once that the resource is applied to a course, how do you do that ongoing assessment of its impact, its value? How and, and I'm assuming that we generate some data or some qualitative information that could be useful for reporting purposes and and assessing impact. I just wonder if that's something that is is, is practiced at the institution. Uh, I know BC Campus does have, um, and I I refer to BC Campus a lot. I worked with them. They're a, uh, a provincial organization that spearheaded an open textbook initiative that started in 2012 and has been very successful. And when you go to the um, open.bccampus.bca, uh, uh, um, and I'll just put the link in the uh, chat for everyone, uh, you can actually see when you're looking at a resource, you can see uh, feedback, reviews that have been done on it. Um, you can, they're working on the reporting of how many people use it, if that's what you're referring to, sort of giving back to faculty to say how frequently a textbook has been adopted. Um, they are looking at having it connected in, in the system that they're currently building on how they might give feedback with regards to demonstrating who's adopted it and where it fits in the course uh, the transfer guide. Um, so equivalent courses that have adopted the book. Um, but it's all very, it's taking, it's not a quick process and it is something that is currently in, in the works if that would be answer to your question of what you're looking at how to. Yeah, thanks very much. It's really useful. And I have a question as well, um, probably more for you, Carolee. Um, how would you suggest um like the udl could be quite an overwhelming concept um for someone just getting started like how how would you suggest maybe some small steps um 
people can take to start moving their their content or their courses or their um, you know textbooks further towards um, a UDL approach? Like, what small things might they be able to do to start that? Uh, I think just looking at what are what do they see students encountering barriers? Um, mm -hmm. You know, do you have and and some of it comes down to even just using the basic accessibility checklists as a starting point. Um, but you can certainly take it beyond in the sense of of reflecting on a cultural. Have you got? I think Sarita's uh, description of having the right having the images go through the text that you're using. What are your images showing? Are they showing the same people? Are they showing different people in different settings? Um, you know, one thing it, now I, I'm thinking of this in terms of building an OER or building a textbook, but it could also be in your course materials. Are you using examples that are diverse? Um, I'm working with a faculty member right now who's trying to bring Canadian uh, statistics to a, an open book that's out of the States and all the examples are American based. So starting with it one thing at a time looking to to change those to have them Canadian and have them um, maybe in different forms uh, so that there is a bit more the visual have they got a visual or are they only describing it are they um, have the, can they you know just so it's just sort of one thing one example to take at a time as a baby step um, are they looking when they uh, they're looking at their syllabus is the syllabus only in text? For some learners, yes, you have to read text, but you only process so much. So could you put visual in? There'd be one step, one small thing to start with. Could you put a, a visual representation of your how your grades are being distributed? There's lots of things, there's lots of one steps that you could do. Thanks. I can see someone's posted in the chat, um, OER Research Toolkit. Carolee, you mentioned that um... I think it was you, Carolee, or uh, it was uh, that UDL is not about checklists. And I was just thinking about that for a bit um, in terms of, you know, on one hand, we want to be systematic and comprehensive in the way that we're inclusive and thinking about it. On the other, on the other hand, we don't want to be prescriptive. And when I was thinking about how I can put some of these things into practice, here at Latrobe with our OER, I was thinking about adapting a checklist um, being used by uh, USQ for their open textbooks, which in turn was adapted from the BC Campus Accessibility Toolkit. Um, so I guess my question is, how can we implement universal design uh, in a way that's not like dogmatic or overly checklisty, but also having that kind of structure or something do you know what i mean yeah and, and it's it's a tough it's i think it, the udl application is dynamic is the easiest way to to say it there are frameworks or checklists that you can start with but you'll always find well it doesn't quite fit that so what do you do to remove that barrier you're sort of always thinking about does that present a barrier to somebody? Trying to think of different ways. Um, the accessibility um, toolkit that you just mentioned that, came, that originated at a BC campus, they actually talk about using the idea of personas just to try and see that you've considered different viewpoints. Um, certainly when you start working with, when you sort of turn it loose to students in a sense, they'll give you feedback of, of some of the barriers. Um, and I think you don't, you're never done, I think is the biggest thing. Whereas a checklist, you're done. And that's the, the statement of it's not a checklist because it's never complete. You've always got a different, different combination of, of challenges facing you. You've got a different combination of barriers that surface. 
Uh, and so that's where it's not a checklist. A checklist will help you progress through that you're thinking of things, but it's never it's never check done. That helps, Stephen. Yeah, it does, and I can see some agreements. Well, fire emoticons uh, in the audience. So thanks for that, and also thanks Zachary for posting the. UDL guidelines. I suppose, yeah, guidelines are more in the spirit of that um, iterative, dynamic way to think about it. Yeah. So we have a question that um, that kind of ties to all this, and be interested to hear if this spawns some discussion. Does OEP assume learner readiness, and is that reasonable? And I've just posted it as well in the chat. Just if you can, it's easier to see it. Carolee, can you uh, clarify what you mean by learner readiness? Uh, are you assuming that your learners know how to contribute? And Sarita, did you want to expand on that too? Yeah, um, just I think there's a lot of freedom that's given with creating open educational material. And so, as Carolee said, do, do they feel ready? Um, do they know what what they can do um, with that freedom. And some of you may have experiences where you tried this uh, in your classes. How has that gone? And this really emerged for us. Um, we have in our resources, we've included a link to a presentation or a panel discussion that we did with a couple of former students at Cerritos. And one of them had expressed that when she was given lots of choice, she found it overwhelming. And, and that was really, um, Sarita and I've had lots of conversation further about that and how sometimes we're just assuming that the learners are, they know what they need to give us and to contribute. But sometimes that's where I, I think UDL is really foundational to the open practices because it sort of helps set up your learners to be that expert learner that they know that they are purposeful and motivated, that they are resourceful and knowledgeable, and that they're strategic and goal directed. And sometimes our learners aren't quite there. And I think uh, in the comments, uh, student Adrian have really gotten at that as well the, the need for scaffolding, the intentionality. Um, and bringing in that, that UDL, that scaffolding to get those skills. And I think uh, for me, one of the things that's just really amazing um, is a number of students, and it's mentioned in the comments as well, that have never had the choice. And so 